Today is June 6, and this is the 2015 Facility CEO Spatial Technology Showcase. This six-month webinar series is hosted by the Campus Facilities Technology Association and organized by the University of Kentucky. I am Michelle Ellington, and thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today. Today's webinar is being recorded. Both the recording and slides will be made available on the CFTA website. The presentation is estimated to run 45 minutes and the remaining time dedicated for Q&A. Feel free to send any questions during the presentation using the questions dialog box. Your question will be added to the queue and answered at the end or as time allows. At this time, I want to extend a special thank you to today's presenter, Ray Garrett. Ray serves as Senior Manager at the University of Michigan, and today he will be presenting on how the university is using GIS for utilities management. Ray, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Michelle. Before I start, I'd like to thank the CFTA for this opportunity to discuss the Utilities Records Integration's GIS efforts here at the University of Mich Michigan. And also a special thanks to University of Kentucky, and especially Michelle Ellington, for putting this presentation series together. Uh, before I start, I need to take care of a little uh, department business in the form of a disclaimer that the views expressed in this presentation are those of the presenter, namely myself, and do not necessarily reflect the views of the University of Michigan, and the use of any products presented here is by my own choice and does not constitute an endorsement by the University of Michigan. Okay, now that we're done with the business side, um, I have been in working with uh, GIS for uh, since 2006, and we have six FTEs in our department, but essentially two and a half of them work in the GIS area, and one of those is a full-time programmer, so we have one and a half uh, FTEs working directly in GIS. The rest of the group works in records integrations area. and. The uh, campus, there's a lot of stats about the campus, and we've been asked to take and put up some information about it. And when you take a look at these stats, it all depends upon where you're drawing the line at or what the numbers are. Since the utilities department take care, takes care of some buildings outside of the direct Ann Arbor campus, I've included a few of those buildings. And also the gross square feet reflects that also. So it's a fairly significant sized campus and uh, we're, we're spread out a, a fair amount. But the numbers that really matter to us in the utilities departments come from uh, the utilities items. As a utility, we take and we generate uh, power for much of campus. We take care of the medium voltage, essentially 13.2 uh, kilovolts uh, down to line voltage, the low voltage is 480 volts and below. We take care of the water, the sanitary, the storm, uh, chilled water, tunnels, and deliver through tunnels, and also buried lines, steam, condensate, compressed air, domestic water supply, and domestic water return. The only utilities we really don't take care of directly are uh, fiber optic and then uh, dedicated fire service lines. So in these, we have uh, five generators. We have a cogeneration power plant, capacity of 45.2 megawatts. There is 11 major switching stations, eight smaller switching stations, a number of uh, substations, uh, almost 5,000 light poles. And when you take uh, manholes, catch basins, water valves, there's almost 10,000 of those and 670 fire hydrants that we're responsible for. The underground utilities is quite a bit for us. Almost everything on campus for us is underground, and we've got over 300 miles of underground services that we maintain and take care of. So the Utilities Records Integration Department takes care of a number of different areas. We take care of uh, mapping and the web, which is a uh, web interface, which I'm going to talk about a, a good portion today. We also take care of our computer maintenance management system for utilities. Uh, we use AIM, also known as FMS. We take care of a number of electrical documentation. And we're the uh, main group that takes care of the interface for the distribution management system. That is a real-time display of what our high voltage uh, electricity is doing across campus. And we administrate the MISDIG area. 
So mapping in the web part is what I'm going to discuss uh, mostly today. But records integration department is really about records integration and how we take and bring data together, how we federate it, and we try to take and eliminate duplication of efforts uh, in the utilities department. So how do you start a utility a GIS system? Well, we went through a process of, of going through and determining and listing the benefits. We had to get management's commitment that they would support this for the long term. Uh, after that, we've taken and determined authoritative data sources and eliminated any duplication or repetition, developed an implementation plan, and one of the most important parts in the utilities area, and, and really in all areas with an implementation plan, is that you have to involve the trades. What we do and the information that we give back is heavily trade dependent. So we made a decision early on in the development of this system that we were going to focus on the trades and not on items that would necessarily directly benefit upper management. Our targets were the trades and the foreman and middle management tier um, to deliver the useful items for them. After the implementation plan, the maintenance can't be forgotten. It's very easy to take them and bring things into the GIS on a one-time basis, but all your costs and your benefits really in the long-term maintenance. And again, the most crucial uh, part of that is involving the trades, because without the trades, uh, your system does not stay timely uh, at all. So for the benefits, we came up with um, it's a single source of truth and an authoritative data source for the data. What we had before this time were tons of paper prints that were spread out all over campus in the back of people's trucks. And uh, it was very difficult to get, a, uh, get the data together in a useful fashion. We also had duplicate systems where things were being maintained in, um, in CAD and GIS on paper and uh, and spreadsheets and other systems. And by having a single source of truth, we could reduce this duplication of efforts. Data federation is extremely important because a lot of systems started uh, out separately. We had to determine which systems, uh, once we got down to a handful of authoritative data sources, uh, which systems needed to be left. What are the fields that we need to be able to take and talk to each other so we have smooth and seamless data interchange between them? Without data federation, you end up with duplication in, in efforts. Another big piece of this was the consolidation of institutional knowledge. Uh, we have a, a work staff that is, um, is aging. There are a number of uh, people, a high percentage, that are going to be retiring in the next five years to ten years. And we didn't want to take and lose that institutional knowledge, a very valuable uh, asset for the university. Also, with having a single uh, source of truth, it enables us to do better planning. Uh, it takes less time to bring information together because it's all right there. And there are less uh, surprises when you go from planning to actual construction. We've been able to take and lower our missed dig costs significantly. And I'll go through this a little bit more uh, later. But the GIS has taken and made a major contribution in lowering missed dig costs. And with that cost, it's not only the cost of execution, but we've also had fewer missed dig hits um, online since the institution of the, this program. Another benefit is consistent and wider distribution of the knowledge. With the separate systems and uh, different pieces of, of paper spread all over the place, we weren't able to get a consistent, uh, we weren't able to get the right information to the right person at the right time in a timely manner. And being able to take and bring this into a single GIS system has been able to deliver that for us. So organizational structure, whenever you're starting out, you have to take and figure out how are you going to organize this. There's a couple of uh, thoughts on organizational structure with GIS. One of them is a centralized GIS system where everybody's in the main department and the 
uh, satellite departments are feeding them. Another is a distributed um, organizational structure where every department has a GIS person in it. And when we first started this at the University of Michigan, we had a dis distributed structure and we really didn't have any centralized core. The GIS had taken and sprung up in different departments independently. There weren't standards. There wasn't data interchange. And that wasn't very efficient. So we've tried to take in and work on correcting that. So what I recommend is really a hybrid between these two structures where we have a core group of uh, people and a department that takes and establishes standards has things like the SDE databases and uh, database maintenance uh, together, and does some of the uh, mapping for some of the departments that have low need. But also, in some of the departments, there are, it makes a big difference because you need subject matter experts to actually take care of the GIS in their departments. So my recommendation, and we've tried to follow the philosophy of keeping the subject matter experts in the individual departments and allowing them to do what they do best and working and knowing their data and then having that feed to a central core that's shared by the other departments so that we've got a real-time updating of data that's shared by all. So again, I don't believe that the centralized uh, format really works very well. It ends up in a lot of duplication of, and efforts, especially from the um, utility standpoint because we have to be extremely accurate in our connections and what's going on in GIS and the amount of effort and time that it takes to do double checking after handing it off to somebody else outside the department is, is cost prohibitive. So with the implementation plan, the GIS uh, standards committee was formed. So we took a member out of the different areas uh, that were doing GIS independently. We brought them together in a committee meeting. We established standards uh, to determine what we were going to follow. We had some things where different shops were even using the different spatial reference. So we had to take an agree on what even spatial reference the university was going to use. And uh, this worked very well bringing all the different groups together. The other items that uh, we also handled were things like uh, who was doing what because some groups were doing the same data updates uh, in each of their different shops. So we made sure that it was an authoritative uh, data source was who was actually doing what for the different trades. We started off and we went to the shops and trades uh, first and asked them what is going to benefit your department? What's going to make your job easier? What's going to save your area uh, time and money? And we tried to be very shop-centric and trade-centric on our development. And then we took and made a jump start with uh, total location uh, locations of water, sanitary, and storm. We knew we couldn't do it all together at one time, so we tried to follow the 80-20 rule. If we take a look at what our largest users are, and that's the plumbing area, which is water, sewer, and storm, and the electrical area, which is the medium voltage and low voltage area. So we had very good uh, prints on the electrical side, and we were able to take and transfer those from CAD into GIS directly. But on the water, sewer, uh, storm side, there were a lot of updates that needed to be made and a lot of questions that we had on uh, some of the prints. So we hired an outside company to do a total station loca locating of every single uh, manhole, catch basin, and valve on campus. And that amounted to about 10,000 items that they went out and found. Throughout this whole process, we involved the trades for data uh, correction. We went to their shops. We brought them paper uh, to, to do markups and corrections on. And we met with them about once a week during this implementation process. So uh, with the standards committee, uh, we resolved the duplication of efforts. Another big area is security coordination. There is a uh, large concern, and rightfully so, by the uh, UM 
a police department on what information should be accessible to what area. Uh, and different departments had different standards for that delivery, so we made sure that we were all on the same page from a security standpoint. Uh, we worked on data federation, established the interchange guidelines. We had to change fields in a number of uh, different groups. Um, databases so that we could take and establish this. And as I mentioned earlier, we had to establish a spatial reference that was universal. We also established the met metadata guidelines. And the uh, committee acts as a continuing forum for resolution of differences and exchanges of ideas. So when we went to the shops, um, we asked them how they were doing their business and had them go through a, a day in the life of and had them take and show us the paper they were using and work us through the, their processes and then ask them, what's wrong with this process? How can we take and improve it? And then um, we took and we got champions in each of the shops that, were, uh, that would help us in taking and bringing the quality of the data up. Now, when we first uh, spoke with the shops, I would say that our uh, response was not all that warm. We tried to take and uh, pick people t to begin with, to take and work with us to uh, bring this online, that were um, comfortable with working with computers, that uh, were uh, savvy working with smartphones and, and other technologies that uh, they were comfortable with. and with those people being seeds in the shops, it's now gone over very well to, to all of the people in the shops uh, virtually, and that's been very successful. But one of the things that we had to do in the very beginning was assure them that we're not going to take any paper away. If they wanted paper rolls, we would continue to give them paper rolls or paper prints. Um, and we have stuck to our guns on that. If there's a need for paper, we will we'll give them paper. But as we've gone through the process and worked over time, the need and desire and request for paper has uh, decreased. We also asked to borrow and return any red lines that they had stashed in their trucks and in the shop. So we had to take and build their confidence a little bit at a time that we would borrow things and then return it. And then uh, also that we would take and meet with them regularly and that we would use their feedback. And a couple of important items with them is that you can only promise what you can do and do what you say. It's very important to the shops that you follow through and that you're consistent on your follow through. That you deliver the, the results that are going to be of benefit to, to them. So with the implementation plan, as mentioned earlier, we had a lot of items that are in uh, CAD, the uh, water sewer storm, the low voltage and uh, medium voltage were in. And for those that uh, did not have good data for it, we took total station of. Now, this is not the device that we used. It's just a scan off the web um, for the presentation. And then we transferred it into, um, into GIS. And it went fairly cleanly and fairly well. There weren't a whole lot of hurdles as far as bringing the data in, the biggest issue was data quality and resolving questions of uh, the quality of the data. So again, with the maintenance plan, you've got to talk with the shops and the trades. They're the ones that are making the changes out in the fields. They're the ones that know when something is wrong that's on the print. And you've got to build a rapport with them and go out and meet with them. Don't invite them into your office. You go out into their shop and, and meet with them. We meet with the shops routinely. Uh, depending upon what the change of data is uh, for the shop, some shops we take and we're down to once a month now for meetings. Some of them we're down to once a quarter uh, or on an as-needed basis. But if there's a, a high period of change, then we increase that based on what the need is. And the, the tradespeople have been extremely responsive and extremely uh, good in, in helping us to take and update the data 
and to make it uh, make it a, a benefit to them and the rest of the university. So for all of our end users, it builds a lot of confidence in them if the updates are timely and routine. We try to take and do an update of minimum of once a month. Sometimes it's twice a month, um, but at minimum once a month for the uh, shop data. If it's there in a high period of change, I could be updating uh, once a week. And then with the maintenance plan, there needs to be a balance. Uh, since we did the 80-20 rule to begin with, we took and we still had 20% of the uh, utilities that we had to do uh, and implement them. So we did those during the maintenance plan. So we, we planned our staff so that uh, we could take and implement these new utilities over a, a period of time and then um, as the new utilities were added on and they retired and we were still maintaining, we could take and, and do updates and improvements uh, for the, the website and for the mapping. So we had all this information in SDE, and then we have the question, how do we get the information to the end user? And do we use paper? Well, we certainly started with paper. Do we take and train people with ArcMap? ArcMap is um, a very good tool, but it's potentially uh, difficult for uh, or time consuming for a tradesman. Not, not difficult, but it would be expensive to, to train all the tradespeople in doing that. Or do we give them a simplified format on the web? So what we decided to do was have a, a web portal interface for uh, the information and, and trying to follow the 80-20 rule again, trying to get out at least 80% or 90% of the information that they need and leave our map to the power users. So right now, we put out about 2% paper, 2% of the users use ArcMap, and 98% uh, use the web. Now, I know that adds up to more than 100, but there's crossover with the ArcMap and the paper users where they use the web also. So with the, uh, the website, we, we're currently on our third generation of it. This latest last uh, update of it. We've made it a responsive design so it is multi-platform. It can be used for mobile, iPhones, iPads, Androids, uh, surfaces out into the field. And we found it to be very robust and um, the, the folks like it out in the field very much. The technologies that we use uh, for this uh, is based on HTML5, uh, cascading style sheets and JavaScripts, the core. We work with the uh, Esri JavaScript API, Dojo, uh, Backbone, Marionette, Underscore, Bootstrap, jQuery, and uh, all of this is being served out of an uh, SDE server. I'm going to switch over to our web map for a minute and then show you what we've actually created. So here we have a uh, the campus of the University of Michigan. And like any other map, you can scroll in, you can pan, and do other items. A couple of the things that are different about this map is from a security standpoint. We have a lot of different areas that we take and supply information for, and there's a concern about the right person getting the right information. So each user can be taken and assigned what their base shop is going to be, and then what access rights they have to any of the other shop information that's in there. So a person working with the light poles, for example, will automatically default to power and lighting when they come in, and they will have access to any other service layers that they have permissions to that they've defined. So some of the items and, and things that uh, we can do with the website uh, we've got different base maps. It's easier to print off a grayscale, uh, aerial maps, uh, the DSMs of it. You can take and bookmark uh, different areas. We've got IR maps of campus, uh, pieces of campus. And uh, we also have some historical um, 
aerials and the uh, topos. So for each shop, they can have special layers uh, for their individual areas. So for example, we're in the process of switching over to LED lights on our campus lighting poles. So we have them marked as a special layer that can come out and let them know where they're at in case there's a service issue or if they're planning to do replacements or expansions. Uh, they're doing some sections at a time and they're doing all repairs if the pole's been damaged and if the head has to be replaced, they're replacing it with uh, LEDs. Sodium lamps uh, take a different degree of maintenance and there's some other issues with those so they've asked for the sodiums to be uh, put out. And then we do things like, uh, like funding. There's a difficulty when a, a call or trouble areas come come in and there's uh, lights out on the building, who actually funds it? So our work management system uses this to be able to take and uh, help determine funding. The same thing with uh, the light poles. There's a number of different funding areas for light poles, so we take and we spell it out if one's hit. Who do they take and put the charges to when they put in the work order? And these kind of differences are, we have these kind of differences for all the different layers in all the different shops that are in there. Now, unfortunately, because of security reasons, I can't really show you um, the other items on a taped uh, broadcast, but the um, when we have the CFTA conference this summer, I can be, be happy to show you the different areas on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Other items that we have are things like the key plans. Now unfortunately I can't show key plans for a regular building but here's a parking structure which has a low security uh, issue with it but you can take and put in and highlight the different rooms, different floors and depending upon whether you have assets on there or not the assets can show up on the individual floors themselves also. So this is uh, we have this for most of the buildings that are on campus, but not 100%. For the uh, main menu for the areas, user settings, they could take and create their own shops out of their layers that they want instead of the assigned ones. They can have their own default base map for a background so that they can take and tune it to what their real needs are. In the tools area, there's a as-built management tool that allows you to go out and draw a box around a spatial area and then we've got close to 400,000 documents that are registered spatially that we can take and bring up the information that's within that area. Identify is like the uh, standard ESRI identify where you can bring up information on an item We've also done some things to tie them into outside databases where we can pull up information on, uh, in this case, this is all the light poles that are attached to that lighting circuit that I clicked on. Or if we're clicking on an individual light itself. then we can pull up details for that individual light. So there's a number of other databases that we've integrated with uh, on the outside to get better information to the end user. Uh, we've done things like a street view, and this helps take and bring out, um, the goal with this is to enable the people to show somebody in the shop where they're going on campus and what's around the area so that if you have a qualified electrician that doesn't know the area but you have a work order ticket to, to fix this bollard here that they can be shown if there's any obstructions in the area by somebody who knows it back in the shop so you only have to send one person out instead of two. We can pull up other different types of maps and things in our split screen uh, so we can take and put up the aerials next to the regular uh, base maps. 
put them in sync with each other and they'll move with each other. And then we can do the standard things like uh, like measure the different areas. Uh, do a, a regular print. We've got both the vector, which we is the high quality or slow, and then the raster version. It's very nice when Esri switched over and we could do the high quality uh, prints so we can get up to an architectural E size on the prints now, and they come out very nicely. Uh, search is a standard search. Mystic tickets is one thing I want to spend a minute on. We worked with the Mystic system in Michigan, and we've gotten them to change the format of their tickets. So now that we're, we're receiving points for the Mystic's area, we can actually map them. So when a Mystic ticket comes in, they can take and either uh, do a ticket search, or they can pull up a ticket, and they can see what area that it actually intersects with. This has saved the, the groups a, a lot of time and effort. As far as uh, just looking at this, they can tell they've got a little in the area, a very small amount right here. Depending upon what the construction is, they may or may not have to, to flag that. But this is an emergency one, and it comes in as a different color. And a rush one comes in as a different warning also. We're working on the process to be able to take and clear the tickets with Mystic directly from within the, the website, and we hope to have that going this fall. But we can do this shop dependent for uh, all the different shops that we're doing Mystics for, and we can also change using a time slider. The Mystic tickets are time enabled and, and narrow down the scope of the time that we're looking for. I want to go back out to a larger view, and we'll go back to gray map, and I'm going to switch over to the mist dig layer. Um, one of the items that we had in special layers when we started mist dig to begin with, we started on a grid system, and every shop would have received tickets for the entire grid. But by taking and utilizing GIS, we were able to take and bring down the amount of mystic tickets uh, that we actually receive so that when we're looking, for example, on uh, tunnels, tunnels is a much smaller area. We've decreased the tickets that they've received by at least 80%. Um, ITS is a much smaller area also. I mean, all the shops are much smaller, and we've reduced the, the tickets that have come in by at least half some of them by as much as 80%. So we've saved a lot of money by being able to take and uh, utilize the, the mapping capabilities, submitting those maps to MISDIG, and then having the MISDIG tickets come back as a focused uh, ticket versus the entire grid system. So there's a lot more that's uh, in the website, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move back to the presentation. So other areas that we're working on, we take and we are responsible for a distribution management system, which takes and monitors the state of the uh, medium voltage electricity across the entire campus. So we've got our uh, central power plant, our different switching stations, the 350 some odd substations and the, the low voltage stations over that. Green shows that they're de-energized, red shows that they're energized. This is live data coming in for the whole campus and we can take a look at this data in a number of different ways. It starts with ArcFM GIS data which is an add-on to ArcMap and we import the GIS data into the distribution management system. It takes and gives a um, a GS map that is responsive to the actual voltage state or any of the other states that are capable in the distribution management system and allows us to take and manage outages and do switching order uh, systems in a, a very timely and, and quick manner. We've worked with the digital surface models. This is a, an example of the U of M stadium. 
and then taking a topo on top in our existing buildings. We find this one to be the most useful in, in doing uh, work when we're looking for different areas. We are in the process of doing an RFQ for an update on a LIDAR flyover either this fall or for the spring. Uh, it's kind of getting kind of late, so I don't know if we'll make the fall, but we're hoping to get it in this spring. We've had a small uh, area of infrared flyover. We haven't been able to get enough support to do it the entire campus, but we do have a small area uh, that we've done. And we can find things like steam leaks uh, from that. Some of the ones that we did in the test area were known, like it was known there was a small leak here. But what wasn't known was the full extent of the compromise of the insulation on the piping. And the piping compromise on the insulation actually goes back this whole distance in the parking lot. So we're able to make a much more intelligent uh, decision on how far back we're going to correct uh, the issue. Uh, with an IR flyover, flyover, you can do things like checking roof damage also. Show border lines are real tough to see, and condensate lines are tough to see. But if you do it at the right time and the right time of year, you can also pull that data out. Uh, we have had uh, high quality aerial flyovers. Uh, we've had three inch resolution on those. And uh, we had both obliques and orthos done on the last flyover. And I'd recommend to everybody to get uh, three inch flyovers now that the cost is dropping down. Uh, try to get it into your budget to do that. It's, it's well worth, uh, worth your while uh, to have that done. We can find so many more items and for a lot of the things where we're trying to take and place them on the map, for example, we have 4,500 light poles. We did not go out and do total station on the light poles. We figured initially that if we could get them within 20 feet, then if they couldn't find the pole, then there was an issue we couldn't help with. But what we have done is taken the aerials and both with trees and with light poles, use the ortho representations to be able to line them up much better than we have in the past. Uh, some of the, um, when you're looking at especially trees uh, from the ortho, um, you can't take and see where um, the base is. But when you put it into oblique form and look at it from a couple of different angles, it's very easy to see where the base is and you can center up that tree properly. With over 17,000 trees on campus, we just can't go around and, and shoot every single tree. We, we've got to be able to do it from an aerial perspective. We're also working on a, a city engine 3D campus. And so why as a utility department are we working in 3D? We want to better accurately re represent the buried utilities, tunnels, and then also the building light locations. Uh, we have a difficult time uh, finding those from a maintenance management system perspective at times. The descriptions are not always good, or it's tough to tell which uh, equipment and assets you need to bring out to be able to do the job. Also, we believe that it's going to help with MISDIG in project planning, uh, reduce our engineering costs, and as part of our plan uh, to integrate with BIM and close cycle uh, the campus with them, GIS, and uh, City Engine. So as Michelle mentioned at the beginning of the program, uh, the CFTA annual conference is being hosted at, the, at Michigan State in East Lansing in August. I'll be presenting a, uh, a paper on Friday, August 5th, uh, 14th at 9.45 AM on the City Engine uh, project and, and what we're doing with those efforts. We're also working on point clouds to BIM to GIS and BIM to AIM, which is our uh, computer maintenance management system. And we are in the process of scanning all of our tunnel systems. Uh, we're about 40% done. And we're just beginning the effort to do the, the transfer over to BIM. And we're doing this to be able to reduce the, the costs in maintenance and also in uh, rebuilding and engineering it. And this is project is just beginning. Uh, we were working with uh, Taurus Solutions earlier this year to um, as a pilot project for that. And uh, Taurus and, and uh, 
I will be presenting a, a presentation on Thursday, August 13th at the CFTA conference uh, also. So if you're interested in the uh, BIM to GIS and point cloud to BIM and what we're doing for the tunnels, uh, please join us then there. So I would like to encourage everybody to come to the CFTA annual conference. It's the Silver Anniversary. Uh, be at Michigan State University in East Lansing, August 11th to 14th, and you can register at uh, www.cfta.org. So at this point, I'd like to turn it back over to Michelle and open it up for any questions. Thank you, Ray. That was um, very impressive impressive and thorough overview as a university who is standing at the edge of the utilities forest looking in and wondering which path to take, I am going to look towards you and your university for guidance. Um, I do want to ask, when did you start on your utilities data development efforts? We started about six years ago uh, with the transfer from uh, CAD to GIS, we had had paper maps all along, and mm -hmm. you know some of the tunnel systems go back into the 1920s and 30s, and uh, but you know they were out of date and not accurate, and uh, so part of it was a lot of finding of the assets that we knew were there, but we didn't quite know exactly where they were all at, and again with the 80/20 rule, we could we uh, first pass through, we, we got 80%, I think, and then over the last five years, we've kept getting it up, and I think we're in the 98, 99% range right now. And was your web application developed in-house? Yes, the web application was developed in-house. Uh, this is the third generation that we're on. The uh, first generation, I wrote it about 95% myself, and that was based on the .NET SDK and we elected to drop that SDK, so we switched over to the Silverlight SDK, and um, most of that was done by a programmer that, on my staff, and I worked on about 20% of it. And then Microsoft has decided to take and uh, get rid of Silverlight, so we're forced to switch again, but it's actually for the better because with responsive design, we can go out onto iPads and and phones and stuff and get into a much larger market. When we first started this, there was no such thing as an iPad, so it wasn't even in our sights as a target market. And um, is any of the data still maintained in CAD, or are you all GIS at this point? We are all GIS for all the spatial locations. Now, there are still um, schematics that are kept in CAD. And two reasons. We've got some schematics that are um, coming from GIS, but one, we haven't had the time to work on it very much. And it's not the easiest thing to do uh, in the Esri flat, uh, platform to get the kind of schematics that we're looking for. So um, campus-wide, everything is GIS. Uh, the authoritative data source is in GIS, but we we do schematics still probably 95% in CAD. Have you experienced um, any positives or negatives in experimenting with the ArcGIS schematics extension? The biggest problem we've had is we haven't had a lot of time to work on it. Um, we're strapped from a, we're challenged from a uh, resource perspective like most departments are, so we've, we've done some work with it. Uh, we do have some things that are coming out in it, but we just don't have the time to go deeper in it. So who would you say is your primary audience and user group? Would it be the trade shops, um, or how about upper management, and how are each of them using it differently? So that's actually is a very interesting question because we targeted this for the trades and initially it was geared 100% just for utilities and nobody outside the utilities could see it. And then we, the middle management and utilities started using it as 
as a tool working with people outside of utilities. And we, it was uh, discovered that you know this is really a big benefit to a much larger larger audience. So we opened it up to uh, AEC, the Architecture, Engineering, and Construction Group, and the rest of facility maintenance here on campus. And actually, our biggest user now is AEC, uh, not utilities, of the information. So they're responsible for new building planning, uh, major construction, and they use it for looking for hits and uh, what's in the way where I can take and move um, construction equipment. If I'm going to work on an area and I turn off a fire hydrant, am I still covered well enough? And they can do it very, very easy in the GIS platform, whereas before they had to pull in a lot of information. So they're using it from the planning standpoint much more. The uh, utilities people are using it for where are the things out into the field and where are my circuits actually running and tracing. You know, every, we have 99.99% of our items underground, so it's not very intuitively obvious to know where, where the wires are going. So they, um, when there's a break, they'll use it for locating the break much easier. The distribution management system will take and help you locate breaks for the medium voltage stuff, but the uh, they use it for the valve exercising programs, for the locations of the items, for all the maintenance programs that are located. When you have a the maintenance system used to just take and put out do poll number X Y Z, and that was one out of 4,500 polls, and it might tell them what street it was on. It would tell them what street it was on, but you want to try to get the, the maintenance person to the right pole the first time without having to hunt for it. And by putting out maps with our maintenance packages for valve locations, pole locations, people doing TM work or um, corrective work can get there the first time without having to hunt. Now I know when I was watching your website demonstration, I could have watched it for probably another hour and really uh, you know, dive into just functionality after functionality. Uh, one thing I didn't see, which you, it may be in there, uh, I'd like to learn more about, is how do people report changes in the map or in the data or any types of changes to your office? And can you describe, you know, the staff that you have involved making those updates and what that process entails? So in version 3, we have not added redlining back into it yet. We did have redlining in there in version 2, and version 3 came out a month and a half, two months ago. And again, the 80-20 rule, we got out a substantially complete product, but it doesn't have 100% of the items that are in there. So once we add redlining back in, they'll be able to take and put the notes back in directly on the map. and. Uh, if a pole is moved or an item is moved, they can note it there. Most of the time what they're doing right now is they'll take a, a printout on a B-size in the shop of the area that they're looking at and then literally redline it and either scan it and send it back to us or take and uh, mail it back to us and then we'll do the updates here. What percentage do you feel of all your users are using the technology as a choice for viewing as opposed to the paper product? I think most of them are. The issue with the paper, and they found this uh, very early on, is that the paper becomes out of date so fast that they want the latest information. When you're going out there and you're doing uh, things like lighting pole, rewiring, and you're having to hand dig this stuff, you don't want to have to and dig because of the depth uh, and the necessity because of other items in the area, you don't want to hand dig in the wrong spot. So they want the latest information, not an old map. It makes their job much, much easier uh, by using the up-to-date information. And there a, was a big cry to get it on iPhones. Uh, and that's what the Release 3 does for us, is that they can actually go out there and look at it on their iPhone or on a department iPad and see what's in front of them at that time and 
have a, a reasonably high degree of confidence that they're in the right area. Now, we're not 100% on everything underground by no means, but they have been very, very good at letting us know when we're wrong So that, because they don't want to dig in the wrong spot twice. That makes sense. Um, what about your data development procedure? Did you rely on ESRI data models or any other industry standards, or did you design your own? Part of it was inherited. Uh, the data was, a, was not 100% uh, a scratch pad, so part of the information had to come from uh, what we were already delivered to. One of the reasons is, is that we were interchanging with the city of Ann Arbor information and with the county of Washtenaw. So where they had data sets that uh, were already in existence, we needed to start with their format uh, so that we could exchange data back and forth with them seamlessly. It goes back to the data integration and federation standpoint. Now we've added some fields into those uh, data sets, but um, you need to take a look at who you're going to be sharing with um, before you start with a, a different standard for for your data. Uh, so, and that's where a, a lot of it came in. Now for the electrical side, we use the uh, ARC-FM data models and we're consistent with those. So those did come off the shelf. Uh, they've had very little changes by us. and. There are some things that we can change to it, but other things we're kind of forced to leave it as, as it is because of the integration with the distribution management system and to be able to get the, the data back and forth. Great. Um, I have a question here that talks about your GIS standards and the committee. So can you describe a little bit more you know, about that? And then also, what about the colors? and the symbology that you chose with your standards. Did you go with something that was more of a you know, recommended best practice, or did you have certain needs in-house to create a different look, a different feel for thematic mapping? So with respect to the uh, standards committee, it comprised of at least one or two people from each of the primary players in GIS around the campus in the uh, business and finance area. And really we had developed or started developing in our own silos. Uh, some of it had been going on long term for many, many more years than the utilities department was involved with it. And some other groups were, were new. And essentially we just got us all into the same room. And this was these were the execution people. This was not management that we invited in. Uh, these are the people that are the doers. And we said, OK, what makes sense? Where do we need to split this up as far as who's doing what? Uh, so we get an authoritative, responsible source for the data set. And then how are we going to take and match the field so that we can interchange? And what are our constraints that are put on by either the, the city or the county? or uh, from a security standpoint by UMPD. And it just took a number of discussions going through all the different items um, and all the data sets to, to get them mostly resolved. Is everything 100% resolved? There's still items that we can work on to clean up. But um, I think we've done a good job in bringing the different groups together to a, to a consensus. Now, as far as what our symbology is, a lot of that is actually inherited from CAD from a consistency standpoint so that the trades would be able to relate to what they've been receiving for the last 10, 15 years. So to make them comfortable, we kept a lot of the same symbology that they were used to seeing. Uh, some of the areas that we did take and make some changes and is when we have a new data set, we'll go out and we'll investigate what uh, others are doing for that. And we also have to take a close look at contrast between the other data sets. Because when you get this many utilities together and you turn them all on for a missed dig, 
and that's what's done a lot in the planning area, is that you'll have every single utility turned on. It's just a big plate of spaghetti there. So you have to make sure that they contrast enough to stand out. So we try to make sure we use web safe colors for it, um, and that they contrast, and that they, they follow uh, MISTIG coloring guidelines or guidelines from uh, what the CAD originally had for consistency. Great, thank you. Um, now about Miss Dig, do you have any recommendations for campuses where there is no system in place to call before you dig or it goes through certain departments that you just have a hard time finding out how to be notified? Well, every state has a Miss Dig system uh, in it, so you would need to take and you know, find out what the regulations and the laws are for your individual state. As required by Michigan law, we have to have a MISTIG system here because uh, we actually own the utilities that's being distributed going out. So we have no um, no option there, and we've participated in MISTIG for years and years. Um, so it, it's all going to be dependent upon state law on the best thing to do whether you have to be a, a source or not. And if you're not a source, uh, you can find out whether there is a notification policy with your MISTIG group for your state, and then also whether there's a thing called a design ticket in your state. Uh, for Michigan, there is a, a design ticket system also that was begun April a year ago. And what that does is if somebody is planning on doing work in the area, they put a request in with the engineering or architecture department for your school if you've registered. And then you can respond with all the items that are uh, within that area. So that protects your assets, and it also gives you a head up of something being done in your area. But it depends upon a lot of the state law, so each, each group will have to see what their requirements are. Okay, thank you. And the last question we have time for today is that you mentioned viewing assets on your floor plans. Uh, which assets do you maintain? We only maintain the utility side. Uh, so that is things like the first shutoff valves in the buildings for all the utilities, uh, the backflow preventers, uh, transformers, uh, medium voltage switch gear, uh, everything that's on the pad, and but we can take and display any asset that uh, that they want to. There's discussions from the IT com group for displaying computers and computer cabinets and uh, which closets have the, the fiber in where the um, the wireless connections and everything is, is at. But so far, we are just showing utility items, where the breakers are at for outdoor lighting, for example. We show where the, the terminal panel is for those. Um, and that's really the extent of it right now. But we have the capacity to do whatever they want to show. And one, of the, things, one yeah. of the things that our maintenance management system does do is if you click on the asset in the maintenance management system, there's a link in there that will automatically open up the key plan, go to the floor, locate the room that the asset's in, and if the asset's placed in the room other with a specific lat lawn, it will point out the lat lawn in the room where it goes to. So it's, it's very robust in that sense. Great, thank you. Well, I think that just about wraps up this webinar today. Um, thank you so much, Ray. It's been a pleasure. I've been wanting to see and learn more about your utilities on your campus for this whole past year. So I've waited a long time to, uh, to watch this, and it was worth the wait. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, for Michelle, for uh, hosting this. And look forward to seeing you at the CFTA conference at Michigan thank State that. University. Thank you, and that you will. I'd also like to thank all the attendees who joined us today and remind them that the next webinar in the Geotech Showcase is scheduled for June 23rd. Larissa Kruger will be joining us to present on GIS and BIM integration at Ohio State and their approach to creating a perfect 3D world for managing campus facilities. For more information on future webinars in this series, visit the CFTA website at www.cfta.org.